Hey, and good morning, New Bern. I know this is a little strange here this morning, but this is the North Carolina History Theater with uh, Bill Hand. And I know what you're thinking. Everything was everybody was running late, but Bill Hand's not here. Um, no, Mr. Hand could not make it this week. I'm afraid. So uh, <laughs> it's, we have a guest host. A guest host. That, that, that's right. So we're going to be doing a little ad lib theater here tonight. So as soon as I finish getting setting these cameras up, I'm going to be. Uh, joining Mr. Twain, correct? Yes, yeah, Samuel Clemens, if you want the absolute moniker, but most people know him as Mr. Twain. Uh, okay, well, give me two seconds, and I'm going to join you in there. Sounds very good. Sounds very good. I hope you're all doing very well out there today. Uh, I'm walking around in this suit and this white hair, and I've had more people ask me about serving them up chicken that I know what to do with in this town. So how are you today, sir? I am doing <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I forgot you were not near that microphone. You see, in my lifetime, microphones were not a thing yet. So, uh, uh, see, you, haven't, you haven't quite figured out you know, how they work. Right? Uh, no, not so, quite, not quite. I, I notice the closer I lean, the more I hear me. So that's, uh, <laughs> I've, I've at least got the gist of it all. I've got the gist. Uh, You've been spending a lot of time in Newburn here. Uh, I, I have lately. of late. I've been practicing and planning for, well, part of my lecture tour, you know, uh, during my lifetime, I, I did a couple of lecture tours. There's this thing called the page typesetting machine that was invented in the 1800s. And a young gentleman showed it to me, and it was an, a, a machine that automatically set up type for newspapers. And in my day, that was quite an invention. I, men spent hours and hours putting those little letters in to, to put the paper together. And I thought this was brilliant, and I sunk so much money into that disaster that I went completely broke, and the only way to recover from my uh, financial difficulties was to take off on a world tour. Yeah. So uh, this is part of that world tour now, extended a few years. So in um, – see, so how do I ask this question in this time period? Because uh, your normal time period was – uh, well, I was born in Florida, Missouri in 1835, and uh, I passed from this world in 1910, the same time as Haley's Comet passed through. So is your first visit to New Bern after 1910 or before 1910? Uh, my first actual visit to New Bern is right here in 1910, <laughs> I, I must say. Uh, I never quite got down to North Carolina. Okay. Uh, I was born in Missouri, of course. I spent a lot of time out west in Nevada, California, out to the Sandwich Islands. You know them as Hawaii. And uh, after I started to achieve some fame with my writing, I moved up to Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. Now, we didn't have internet in 1835 to 1910 and, and, and all of that. How did How did your work... Did you know how popular your work would be in your lifetime, or, um, you know, did it, was it after your lifetime that it really started? To- oh no, no. Uh, um, if if you look at some of your own historians, uh, you had a man named one man, uh, Ron Powers. He wrote a book about me, and he described me as the world's first rock star. Really, uh, I was. Uh, they had groupies stuff following you around. Oh, oh, indeed, indeed. Even kings and queens, and and, and you just name it, we had them all. Uh, but um, I, I should make a little mention here now. Now you see the the clothes that I, I do wear. I didn't always wear white, but it was what I was best known for. So so nowadays, if you come out of a grave and wear anything but white, nobody has any idea who you are. But um, I've always enjoyed good-looking clothes. If you know what I mean. Uh, I've I've traveled the world a great deal. And I have mixed with kings, I've mixed with savages, I've mixed with common, ordinary people. One thing has always stood out to me wherever I've gone, and that is that clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society at all. <laughs> that, um, and you should be very happy I didn't show up in that kind of condition. <laughs> Definitely not. So, we are going to be, uh, is this a reenactment? Are we reenacting an actual interview? Ah, that well, occurred? well, whenever I say anything real, and that goes right down to my autobiography, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Okay. That's it. Some, some of it is, some of it is not. Now, this is a little piece I wrote. Uh, interviews were just becoming all the rage back in the mid-1800s and uh, 1860s, 1870s. I mean, there were newspaper writers all over the place, yellow journalists and whatnot, but uh, the actual art of the interview was fairly new. 
and it was a, a, an experience for me. You, you'd sit down, you'd talk to these people, and the next day you'd be amazed at what you must have said because it didn't sound anything like you remember talking. But uh, this is a little piece I put together kind of describing my feelings in my first interview. Okay. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and, because uh, it was written so long ago, I no longer remember it all, so I'm going to have to read. And uh, Mr. Queen here is going to read the part of the interviewer. And again, you are the gentleman in the bold print. Ah, got it. Now, am I Eric or am I, do I have to get in character for this? Well, do we I shall call you Eric. Okay. We that should. works for me. Okay. So so you so do I, not I, have I a specific I don't need movie. to be in like, I don't, I don't think I could do the 1910 Oh, no, we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> be, be as 2022 20, as you wish to be on this. Uh, Although I come on camera a lot. I do not have yeah. the stage talent. <laughs> I, I see, I see. Well, let's see how this goes now. Okay. Now, we start out with a nervous, dapper, pert young man. That's you. Oh. Took the chair and I, I off, that I offered him, and he said he was connected with a daily thunderstorm. And then he added, Hoping it's no harm, I've come to interview you. I'm sorry, I've come to what? interview you ah i see yes yes uh yes yes uh, you know i was not feeling well that morning indeed my power seemed a bit under a cloud however i went to the bookcase and when i'd been looking six or seven minutes found i was obliged to refer again to this young man and i said how do you spell it spell what interview oh my goodness what do you want to spell it for i don't want to spell it i want to see what it means well this is astonishing I must say, I can tell you what it means if you, if I'll, you. Oh, all right, that'll answer, and, and much obliged to you too. In in ter ter inter. Oh, then you spell it with an I. Why, certainly. Oh, well, that's what took me so long. Why, my dear sir, what what did you propose to spell it with? Well, I I uh, I, I hardly know. I had the on abridged, and I was ciphering around in the back end, hoping I might see her among the pictures, but it, it's a very old edition. Well, why, my friend? They, they wouldn't have a picture of it, even in the latest D... My dear sir, I, I beg your pardon. I mean no harm in the world, but you do not look as intelligent as I expected you would. No harm. I mean, no harm at all. Oh, no, no, don't mention it. Uh, it has often been said, but by people who would not flatter and into, and who could have no inducement to flatter, but I am quite remarkable in that way. Yes, yes, they, they always speak of it with rapture. <laughs> I can easily imagine it. But about this interview, you know it is the custom now to interview any man who, who has become notorious. Oh, indeed. I had not heard of that before. It must be very interesting. What do you do with it? Ah, well, 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 this is disheartening. It ought to be done with a club in some cases, but customarily it consists in the interviewer asking questions and the interviewed answering them. Ah. It is all the rage now. Will you let me ask you certain questions calculated to bring out the salient point of your public and private history? Oh, oh yes, with pleasure, with pleasure. Now, I, I have a very bad memory, uh, but I, I hope you will not mind that. That is to say, it is an irregular memory, singularly irregular. Sometimes it goes into a gallop, and then again it will be as much as a fortnight passing a given point. Uh, this is a grief to me. Oh, it's no matter. So... You will try to do the best you can. I will. I will put my whole mind to it. Uh, thanks. Are you ready to begin? Ready. Question. How old are you? 19 in June. Indeed. I would have taken you to be 35 or 6. Where were you born? In Missouri. When did you begin to write? 1836. Why? How could that be if you're only 19 now? I don't know. It does seem curious somehow. It does indeed. Whom do you consider the most remarkable man you ever met? Oh, Aaron Burr. But you never could have met Aaron Burr if you're only 19. Now, if you know more about me than I do, what do you ask me for? Well, it was only a suggestion, nothing more. How did you happen to meet Burr? Well, I happened to be at his funeral one day, and he asked me to make less noise, and, uh... <clears throat> but, good heavens, if you were at his f funeral, he must have been dead. And, if he was dead... How could he care if you made noise or not? Oh, I don't know. He was always a particular kind of man that way. Still, I don't understand it at all. You say he spoke to you and that he was dead? I didn't say he was dead. But he wasn't dead. 
Well, some said he was, some said he wasn't. What do you think? Oh, it was none of my business. It wasn't my funeral. Did you... However, we can never get this matter straight. Let me ask you something else. What, what was the date of your birth? Monday, October 31st, 1693. What? Impossible. That would make you 180 years old. How do you account for that? I don't account for it at all. But you said at first you were only 19, and now you make yourself out to be 180. It's an awful discrepancy. Why have you noticed that? <laughs> Many a time it has seemed to me like a discrepancy, but somehow I couldn't make up my mind. How quick you do notice a thing. Thank you for the compliment. As far as it goes, had you or have you any brothers or sisters? I, I, uh, I, I think so, but yes. No, but I, I don't remember. Well, that is the most extraordinary statement I've ever heard. Why, what makes you think that? How could I think otherwise? Why? Look here. Who is in this picture on the wall? Is that... A brother of yours? Oh, yes, yes. Now that you remind me of it, that, that was a brother of mine. That's William. Bill, we called him. Poor old Bill. Why? Is he dead then? Uh, well, I, I, I suppose so. I, we never could tell. There was a great mystery about it. Well, that is sad. Very sad. He disappeared then. Well, yes, in a general sort of way. We buried him. Buried him? Buried him without knowing whether he was dead or not? Oh, no, no, not that. He was dead enough. Well, I confess that I can't understand this. If you buried him and you knew he was dead. No, no, no. We only thought he was. Oh, I see. He came to life again. Oh, I bet he didn't. Well, I never heard anything like this. Somebody was dead. Somebody was buried. Now, where was the mystery? Ah, that's just it. That's it exactly. You see, we were twins, defunct and I, and then we... Got mixed up in a bathtub when we were only two weeks old, and one of us was drowned, but we didn't know which. Some think it was Bill, some think it was me. Well, that's remarkable. What do you think? Oh, goodness knows. I, I would give whole worlds to know. It's solemn. This, this awful mystery has cast a gloom over my whole life, but I will tell you a secret which I have never revealed to any creature before. One of us had a peculiar mark, a large mole on the back of his left hand. That was me, and that was a child that was drowned. Very well. Then I don't see there's any mystery about it after all. You don't? Well, I do. Anyway, I don't see how they could ever have been such a blundering lot as to go and bury the wrong child, but uh, shh, don't mention it where the family can hear it. Heaven knows they have heartbreaking troubles enough without adding this. That was the end of my first interview. Interesting. And if you, you can tell there's quite a bit of truth in that particular story, can you not? Hey, and uh, was, was that, uh, like, typical? Like, what goes through Mark Twain's mind when he's having these interviews? Is it like a mixture of reality and fantasy? Oh, yes, I, I had fun with the people. So it was it, all uh, just, it, it was I, in your personality to... Yes, there, there was always some truth in, in what I said, but uh, I, I felt fairly free to bend the facts wherever necessary. Perhaps not like in the, the story there, but uh, yes, yes, it, it is true. So is it accurate to say that most of your stories, most of your writings are in somewhat based on actual events with a sprinkle of like, wouldn't it have been interesting if this occurred? To an extent, that is true. Uh, my first, my first well-known novel today uh, was, uh, of course, Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And uh, that took place in the invented town of St. Petersburg. Most people actually think it was Hannibal because that's what the town was based on, and that's where I did grow up. And many of those events and many of the children and people within the book were based entirely on my own life as a child. Uh, much of Mark Twain's, uh, Mark Twain's, much of Tom Sawyer's little incidents, the fence painting episode was a true story. Uh, there's a story within it in which Tom catches a cat. His mother gives him medicine to take, and the medicine of the day was, was horrible, horrific stuff to swallow. So he gives it to the cat instead and watches the cat bounce off the walls and before it goes flying out a window, and, and that actually happened. 
and uh, many of other things. There are characters, Indian Joe, Indian Joe, you read about. He was a real man, not as bad as he was in the book, but he was a real man, and he did indeed die in that cave that he dies in in the book. Uh, he, he eventually got lost in the case, and they found him many, many, many months or years later, uh, what was left of him. Uh, Becky Thatcher was a real person. Aunt Polly was uh, my own mother. And so on. And there is Huckleberry Finn. Now, Huckleberry Finn in real life, his name was Tom Blankenship. Uh, Huckleberry and Finn was real. I'll he was first. real. He was a young man named Tom Blankenship, and he was, uh, I drew him exactly as he was. He was ignorant, he was underwashed, he was insufficiently fed, but he was the only truly free person in that village because he lived on his own. He never saw his drunken father anywhere around. And, uh, well, he was, as a result, continually happy and uh, tranquil, and oh, we all envied him greatly. And our parents said, you cannot go see that boy. And so, of course, we got more of his company than any boy living. <laughs> That's how, how it went. How come I, your parents didn't want you to hang out it, with him? It, well, he was your, your typical bad example, that uh, tobacco-smoking, uh, young swearing fellow over there who's unwashed and sleeps in the corn cribs or the barns or wherever he can find at night and that kind of thing. Now, eventually, Tom would grow up. The last I knew of him, he was up in the Montana territories, and I believe he had become a district justice. Really? So he did eventually make some of, something of himself. Uh, there are other books, uh, St. Joan, which is actually my favorite book. And, most, and, and he accomplished all that without a formal education? Yes, he did. Interesting. But uh, we're, we're talking about the far west, and that would have been about the 1860s or 70s by the time I had heard of him again. Uh, I was, I was born, as I said, in 35, about 1861, 62, I went out west. I'd become a riverboat pilot before that, mm -hmm. and my career ended one day when a Union cannon put a, a cannonball through my smokestack, and we were informed we were Union soldiers now, and uh, so I kind of <laughs> slipped out of there. I, I became a Confederate soldier and wrote a little story about it called uh, A Private History of a Campaign That Failed, one of my more serious pieces. But we, we practice, uh, we are a small regular force, practice a steady concept of retreat. But eventually I, I left from there and went out west with my brother, Orion. And he had been named secretary of the Nevada Territory. He was hopelessly incompetent, but uh, a, a good fellow despite that. Uh, from there, I, I was his secretary for a while. I became a reporter with the en Virginia City Enterprise. And that was an exciting time. On a slow news day, we'd all go out and burn down a barn and cover it and that kind of thing. It was, uh, <laughs> you got to create the news. Yes, yes. If you don't find news, you create it for the day. And uh, the, the competing papers, we had quite a few going with each other, and we were writing horrific insults. And uh, I wrote stories that were about as truthful as this. I once made up a story that got me in great trouble in which I described this horrific uh, murder of a man and his entire family out on a house out on the prairie and everybody took it as fact and it was completely made up and i nearly got run out of town on that what well, finally got me run out of town i also took a good deal of time by the way covering uh, news down in washington dc okay and i will tell you the corruption you have today is absolutely no different than it was in my day if it has always been a seat of corruption down there but uh Eventually, I, I got into an insulting match with the local editor who challenged me to a duel. And I had little choice but to accept. I tried my hardest to get out of that thing, but uh, I, I, I've never exactly been desirous of, of putting an end to myself or anyone else that way. Besides, I couldn't shoot to save my life. But my friends insisted I do it. They wrote me all kinds, had me writing all kinds of letters, and I'd write these letters, and I'd try and hold back as much as I could. And to my amazement, the editor, the other editor, did not accept my challenge. And so I started getting excited. I started putting more and more words in, and I thought I was completely safe. And then I was shocked when he suddenly accepted. So the next day, we were out there getting ready for the duel. And this man is known to be a pretty good shot, and I'm figuring my life is over. But my friends and I, they take me out into the desert area there, and we're getting ready to practice. And my one friend, who was a very good shot, he takes out his oh, pistol. Hold on a second. Yes. The desert area, where are you guys at? Nevada. Nevada, okay. Nevada, around uh, Virginia City out there. And it, it, it's mountainous, it's dry. Uh, not technically a desert, but uh, anyway, he's standing there about 50, 60 yards off. He sees a bird sitting on a fence. He whips around and shoots that thing. One shot knocks that bird right off the fence. Well, 
my uh, enemy and his friends just happened to be coming over the hill and they saw that bird go down. They did not see who shot it. And they looked at that and they looked how far it was to us. And they said, uh, who did that? And my friend points right at me and says, Sam here did. He said, he did? How often did he do that? And my friend says, oh, about four out of five tries. And my opponent began to look very sick. And he sort of turned and wandered away, never saw him again. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we got back to town, and the officials uh, told us they had heard about the duel and that I had 24 hours to leave if I didn't want to wind up sitting in a jail for my attempts. This is during the time of uh, the Old West, right? And it, it wasn't it, dueling okay in the Old West? It, Drawdowns at high noon. Yes, I, I had seen I had seen a couple of fights like that out there, and and, and yes, it did happen. But there was that law, nonetheless. And uh, certain men, you you are more willing to press a law than others. <laughs> it's, so it's, uh, Virginia City wasn't quite as wild as Tombstone. It was or, wild enough, but it was not Tombstone. No, it was not. Uh, it was uh, it started out as a silver mining town, but uh, from there I been went on to California. And I went to a hotel there in San Francisco where a, I arrived. It was horrific cold. And the lady at the counter, she told me, if you want to get rid of that cold, you just drink a quart of whiskey every 24 hours. And I thought this was very interesting because I had another friend who had once told me exactly the same thing. That made half a gallon. So I drank it and the cold died and I kept on living. But uh, while I was there, I had a uh, pawnbroker come and relieve me of all my property and Tried to get the work I could. Now, this moves into a little story about a poet I knew. And uh, he was out there in San Francisco, and he was also out of a job. And he told me that he thought his life was a complete failure. And I told him, yes, I think it is too. Then he told me he wanted to commit suicide. And I said, all right. It was just, you know, helpful advice to a, a friend in time of need. Well, not entirely helpful advice, but you see, I, I understood that if I could scoop the other papers, I could land a job on this. So I kept his mind working in this way because suicides and changeable lots are quick to change their opinions. And he said he wanted to shoot himself. And I said, that's rather extravagant because uh, between the two of us, we couldn't hire out a pistol. So finally, he said he would drown himself. I said, all right. There's the problem with this, though. He was a very good swimmer. Still, we went down to the beach. I went along to make sure things would go right. And while we were there, do you know a romantic thing happened that uh, it was just full of symbolism for this simple poet? There came in on the Pacific Ocean something that had been floating across the water for a couple of years. It was a life preserver. Now, this was a problem. But I, I had an idea, you see. The, the poet, he never had any ideas, especially when he was trying to write. But I suggested we take that life preserver to a pawn shop and trade it for a pistol. Now, the pawnbroker, he gave us this rusty old derringer, had a ball in it the size of a hickory nut. When I told him it was a poet wanting to shoot himself, he didn't quibble over the price at all. But I have to admit, it was a, it was a rough moment, my friend standing there, with that gun against his head, trembling and hesitating. And I finally said, oh, all right, pull the trigger. And he did. And that bullet cleaned out all the gray matter in his brains. And it also carried away the poetic faculty, and he has been a useful and functioning member of society ever since. <laughs> Absolutely true story, I swear to it. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and continuing my little biography from there, uh, a San Francisco paper started paying me to do writing. I, I wrote The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County during that time, and that was my first big break in fame. The story wandered everywhere, came out east, and was published in all the papers. They all misspelled my name, so it, it didn't help out at first, but uh, I was then sent out to the Sandwich Islands, which is in your, your day is known as Hawaii, and uh, my second big break came when there was a ship that had caught fire at sea and sunk, and its crew was caught in a raft in small boats where they survived for several months on the open water, and they finally washed up in Hawaii the same time that I was there, and I was able to interview them and write up that story. And that got me quite a bit of credit. Uh, from there, I went on, uh, was hired out by the San Francisco paper to take a trip with the Quaker City. And the Quaker City was a tour boat. And it was possibly the world's first pleasure cruise. It was going to uh, the Holy Land. Originally, General Sherman was going to be on board, though he backed out. 
And so we went over and we traveled Europe, we traveled the Holy Land, and I wrote my first book from that, and it was, uh, many people have heard of it today, and it was called The Innocence Abroad. And uh, a lot of the importance of that book in the period of time, when you read a tourism book, they were always full of lofty, beautiful language and everything so melodramatic and, and tearful and, and majestic. And I went over and I wrote what I saw. And it was not anything like you ever read before. And uh, I was, uh, some, some people thought I was a bit disrespectful. And uh, I pointed out uh, the Jordan River and I said, I was, uh, I don't understand why people leave that river out there like that where any dog could come and lap it up. It was so small. And, and uh, I, I gave my honest view. And uh, when, I, when I do my talk in, uh, the end, at the beginning of March here in town, I'll be telling a few stories from that particular book. Outstanding. So, What historical events did you witness in your lifetime? Actually witness... Or not, I mean, but in and how did, did any was there any historical event that impacted your writing? That impacted your you know there was a lot of stuff going on in the American history during that. Yes, time. yes. Um, or a, did you kind of isolate yourself from the 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 big news happenings? Oh, oh, oh no, indeed. I, I I wrote extensively on many things. Uh, some of the things that most infuriated me was the uh, the American wars out in the Philippines uh, from the war of of uh, the Spanish-American War. And, of course, we took Cuba, and then we got to the Philippines. And uh, there were stories that were being written of the heroic actions of the American soldiers fighting all these people who were out to kill them. And it was actually a slaughter in the other direction of uh, them just taking a, a turkey shoot of virtually unarmed men and things along those lines. And I would write with great vitriol about the, the American imperialism. Uh, the, the, the race issues were very important to me. I have always admired the black race, uh, and uh, I, I put a couple of them through college and, and things like that. I was, uh, you know, when I was a child, I had no aversion to slavery at all. Uh, I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. I was, I never heard it rained in my presence. The uh, paper said nothing against it. The pulpit actually stood there, and they said God approved of it. And any man who had any doubts, just look in your Bible and, and you'll see. And then they actually read the verses to us to make the matter certain. And if the slaves had any aversion to it, they were smart enough not to say anything. And in, in Hannibal, it was very rare that we would see a slave abused. Mm. Uh, now, now, there's a, a little story about Sandy. Uh, he was a young little boy. And he was a slave that my family had hired out from some other local people somewhere. And he was from the Eastern Seaboard of Maryland. And he had been taken as a little boy from his family and from all of his friends and shipped halfway across the continent. Now, despite this, he was a cheerful young thing, uh, innocent and, and very gentle and about the noisiest thing you ever saw in your life. He was always singing and whistling and shouting and whooping and it, it was completely maddening to me. It drove me absolutely crazy having to put up with this all the time. And one day, one day, I got so upset with it, I completely lost my temper. I stormed to my mother, and I said, Sandy has been singing for a solid hour. It is driving me crazy. Can you please tell him to just shut up? <laughs> and my gentle mother looked at me, and a tear came to her eye, and her lip trembled. And she said something like this. She said, that poor child... Whenever he is singing, I know he's not remembering, and that, that brings me joy. But when he is silent, I know he is thinking, and that I cannot bear. That child will never see his mother again as long as he lives. And if he can sing, I must not stop it, but be very glad. And she looks at me and she says, now, if you were older, you would understand that. And it was very simple words. My mother was not a one of, of an elaborate vocabulary, but it struck home, and Sandy's music never bothered me again. So you are getting ready to give some uh, a presentation? Yes, or, yes. Uh, uh, on that here here locally. locally. Locally, right over at your history center here at the, at the Tryon Palace owns in the Coleman Hall, I believe they call it. And that is going to be on March the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, the 3rd being a Thursday, 7 o'clock nightly. 
And on Sunday at 2 o'clock, because you've always got to have a, a time for those folks who just don't want to stay up late and see in the show otherwise. But uh, that will be coming up, and you can get tickets at the New Bern Historical Society over at 501 Broad Street, or you can go online to the, they call it a, a website, uh, called nchistorytheater.org. NC Theater, his, N- North Carolina History Theater. Yes. The, the, dot org. But the website we, is NC History Theater. NC, You're right in North Carolina NC History Theater. History Nothing will happen. But theater. yes, and... And I should point out that we are very American, so it's T E R, not T R E in theater, which is a, the British way of saying it. Uh, many many artists like to put that that British spelling to the word theater for some reason. So, well, hold on a second. So the website spelled differently? No, the website is spelled it's history theater T H E A T E R, but many people like to spell it R E, which is the British spelling. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, the, the people like to do their acting and put their little finger in the air and say, I am very sophisticated. I am British. So, what should somebody expect? Well, first off, let's talk about the uh, amenities. So, Indeed. is this a dinner? Is this a cocktail? Oh, is no. This, this will be, a, this is your, your traditional theatrical show. Uh, you, you come in, you uh, pay for your ticket or turn in your ticket, you take a seat. It's a very comfortable hall. The, the seating is raked, meaning the Seats go up at an angle, so there's no no real bad seat. Everyone has a good view of the stage. And uh, it's a two-act production, and we call it Day and Night. And uh, it's very much an imitation of lectures that I used to give. And uh, I would come, and I would discuss general topics that I thought of. I would tell stories, uh, read stories from, from my works, and that kind of thing. And it's what people turned out in the hundreds and the thousands to see in my day. Uh, even even the where, no matter where I would go, uh, India, any place like that, the crowds would turn out. Of course, in that day, England owned three-fourths of the world. So you found good English speakers everywhere you went. And uh, so, so I was, I was well-received. Now, this, we call it day and night. The first act is a time in which I, I tell some of my lighter stories from my early writings and the things I'm more popular for. Uh, Innocence Abroad, which I mentioned I would be talking about, The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. We will be doing a, a little scene from Tom Sawyer, some stuff from Huckleberry Finn, and and so on and so forth, like that from a book called Ruffing It, which described my days out west. And then we come to the intermission, and after that we go into some of my later writing and works. Uh, which which has a little more critical critical work and that kind of thing. And uh, how long is the overall program? You'll be spending a couple of hours there, but it's a well deserved couple of hours. You'll you'll be greatly greatly pleased. You will leave a it. better person. I will yes, you will <laughs> leave a much better person, a, a, a far better person. And uh, in, in, indeed, now, now if anybody's wondering whether they should get tickets, spend uh, t- their money for that or anything like that. Uh, I would tell you a little story. Now, Sarah Bernhardt in our day was uh, Julia Roberts of your day. She was a very well-known, very famous actress. And when we lived in Hartford, she was coming out to do a performance. And the tickets to see her were going to be $5 in our day. Relatively a lot of money back then. back then. Yes, indeed. And we had a couple of poor neighbors, uh, an attractive widow and her daughter. And they were very poor. And they looked at that, and they wanted very much, because they enjoyed the intellectual entertainments, and they wanted very much to see her. But they said to each other, we must not take $5 and spend it on, um, on a mental entertainment. We must take that money instead, if we have to spend it, and give it to a poor family who cannot afford bread to eat. And so those kind Joneses, they took that $5 they had, and they gave it to some neighbors of theirs who were so poor they could not afford bread to eat. And those people took that $5, and they bought tickets to see Sarah Bernhardt. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, some people have taste and uh, intelligence as well. Uh, yes, well, I mean, uh, feeding the mind is just as important as feeding the body. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I, I've seen some of the food of today and remember the food of my day and, and, uh, and what you eat is school paste. I, I want you to tell that, to, to tell and, you that. Uh, and you know what? Um, some of the knowledge fed today is also not good for you. <laughs> no, indeed. I've, I've had taken a few moments to look over that thing you call Facebook, and it is startling, the, the, the things that people will say and believe with deep earnestness, and you wonder, 
my lord, how life has not changed at all. <laughs> it is. Of course, in our day, we had internet. It was called telegraph. Telegraph. And uh, everything you said was in dots and dashes. But uh, we, we could communicate just about as quickly as today. It was just uh, more of a sideways process. Mm -hmm. Did you know how to use a telegraph? I myself, well, yes, I did. I would go into the man. I would say, here's what I want you to send. <laughs> but, uh, or write it out and hand it to him. But no, I could not operate the telegraph machine myself. I, I did not learn that. Now, at, at one point in my life, a telephone came into use. I was the first man in Hartford to have one. I have a couple of firsts. I was also the first man to ever use a typewriter to write a book. Huckleberry Finn was written with a typewriter. And it was the first novel ever written that way. But uh, telephone and I were, were great, great enemies. And... Uh, uh, there were a, a, a few electrical things. There was the burglar alarms, the electrical burglar alarm, which was set off, and it would go off any hour of the night. It didn't need anybody breaking in to go off, and you'd eventually turn it off. And it liked to remind you that it worked. Yes, yes, indeed. So you'd turn it off, and it was easier just to let people come in and carry things off, and it was to have to put up with that crazy thing. So, so, so yes, indeed. Now, now another first. Now, this is something people do not know about me. Okay. But it was an invention. I was an inventor, and I, I invented a few games and things like that. But I invented something that uh, nearly every woman today uses. And I invented it as a means of connecting my shirts. I was tired of the buttons coming loose. But today you know it as a bra clasp. You invented that. So that little hook... That keeps that bra attached on the back of a lady's body that is the, the great nemesis of every young teenage boy. Uh, it was an invention of mine. I, if you look it up in the patent office, you will find my name attached to it. That is fascinating. It, it is indeed. It is indeed. It's not why I invented it, but that is what it became. So why did you invent it? Because I could not stand my buttons constantly coming off my shirt. I needed a way to hook that thing up and keep it closed. And so I designed this little clasp. But when somebody used your little clasp, were you well compensated for it? Well, not really. I, I believe the hundred years has passed on that on that uh, on that particular little patent. But uh, if I received the money, it wouldn't do me much good right now. I'm, I'm moldering in a little box up in Elmira, New York. Beside you could my give wife and, you could give the money to all sorts of people you, who you, needed food. But instead, could and go they to get tickets to see Mark Twain. That's, that's right. They could go. There you have it. <laughs> yeah. That that could be a great idea for it. I I, I agree. I'll have to give that thought. But the, so for all of you out there that have the ability, yes, and treat people to some food of knowledge coming up in March. And there you have it. Uh, you, it's somebody could go. Out, somebody could go out and buy a bunch of bulk tickets. Head over to the community college and hand these tickets out to these young minds seeking. I would quality education. I would absolutely promote that. I would absolutely suggest that. And uh, and if if you do know someone, I'm going to throw this in. If if you know somebody who is, uh, I was, I could be quite charitable when I needed to be to to those who were destitute and down and out and. We would be willing to consider uh, to to certain groups to uh, to the promise place to places like that. If if you've got someone who could really use that pick me up, let us know and we'll we'll find a way to get them in there. Outstanding, not a problem at all. So, and uh, you can call the number. To, the number to call is two five two 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 nine four nine seven seven. My good friend Mr. Hand will answer the phone and talk to you for a bit and probably say, "Well, you need to go to the website. Leave me alone." <laughs> but he'll say it in a more polite way than that. But uh, it it is a good way to uh, yes it, it is a remarkably good evening. So you have a lot of conversations with the North Carolina History Theater. Yes, I do, and we do know that we have yourself performing. That is um, right. That's coming right. up, um, what else is on the horizon? Well, for uh, the History it, Theater. We have a very bright comedy coming up. A uh, comedy, yes, a comedy. I'm a big supporter, and it is a dinner theater. For some people, it is a stage show for some others. It's called Murder in the Manor. And uh, Mr. Hand, he he started writing comic murder mystery plays. You get to come and uh, watch a man die and have a good time all night. <laughs> and uh, what happens is the character dies, and all the characters on stage are trying to solve who did it. And it's one of them who did it. And the audience is watching and the audience is trying to think ahead, too. Uh, your, your murder she wrote and all those shows you watch it and you're trying to figure it out before the heroine does. And they always slip some little sneaky thing in that nobody can possibly solve. But in this case, you're thinking your way through. The actors are thinking their way through. But then they take breaks and they come out into the audience and they talk to you. And you can ask them any question you want. 
and they are required to answer truthfully. They might be evasive, but they cannot lie to you. So you have a chance to figure it out as well. The only one who is allowed to lie is the one who did it. Gotcha. And that one can lie like anything, about anything. And toward the end of a play, it's in five scenes or acts, however you want to put it. And after the fourth scene, you fill out your whodunit form, turn it in, and then you see the resolution. And at the end, the best guess wins a prize. And uh, that is how it works. We've written a, a number of those over the years and have performed a number of them over the years, Mr. Hand has, and uh, they've all gone very well. Again, this is his first one. And it will be held locally. We're, they're doing a dinner theater production for a homeschool group and uh, that has an annual banquet. And uh, that'll be on the 19th, I think. I'm not dead certain. I have to look that one up. But if you're not a homeschooler, you can't go anyway. But And uh, then on the 31st, it will be held out at Carolina Colors at the Pavilion. And if you are a member of the country club out there, you can buy tickets to go to that dinner. For the general public, it will be done on March 25th and 26th, and that will be in Oriental, which is a, about a 30-mile drive from here. It's a nice little drive, nice little town to spend the day in. Uh, go out and look at all the shrimp boats and, and see the sights around there. But uh, it will be at what is called the Old Theater, and that is a, an intimate little theater they have in town that's been there for some years. We've We've worked, uh, Mr. Hand has directed a show or two out there in the past, actually. And uh, it, it makes a very entertaining night. And if you're interested in getting tickets for the Oriental program, you can go to their theater website. And I cannot remember it, but if you put in to your Google Old Theater Oriental, it will come right up and you can order tickets there. Or you can go to Nautical Wheelers. And there are the Nautical Wheelers in Oriental and there are the Nautical Wheelers in New Bern. And you can pick up your tickets there as well. Awesome. So it, it, it should be a very good evening. Now, after that, in April, another show will be done, and this is something that's been done in town before. And, uh, it is of interest to me because, as I said, I had my own little dueling experience. Uh, this is a duel that happened in New Bern in 1802, and it was between Mr. Richard Dobbs Spate, who was a former congressman, the first native governor of North Carolina. Native has been born in North Carolina, and he was also one of the signers of the Constitution. He was the youngest man to sign it. And he gets into a duel with John Stanley, who is a lawyer in town who is famous for his sarcastic wit and his winning ways. And he, he is a congressman at the time. He and uh, Mr. Spate ran against each other. And uh, Mr. Stanley won, which Mr. Spate was not at all happy about. Neither man was known for his temper. And although he got over that, but when Mr. Spate then ran for state senate, for the state assembly, I should say, Mr. Stanley started saying some rather unpleasant things about him to people, trying to keep him from winning. And when Mr. Spate heard about that, it just boiled over and it became the, the duel. And uh, spoiler alert, because it's pretty well known anyway, <laughs> Mr. Spate does not survive this particular yeah, spoiler. duel. spoiler <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I got out of it much, I got out of mine much better than he got out of his. But uh, it's an interesting story as you look at and, and you learn the politics of that day. It was a it was a time when the political parties were actually forming, and uh, the the people on Washington's side and the people on Thomas Jefferson's side, and they were like like Hillary and Donald of your own day, as far by that point, uh, and their views were so extremely different, and they were coming to strongly dislike each other. And John Adams, who was one of Washington's people, had passed the Alien and Sedition Acts which, uh, among other things, made it much harder for, for foreigners, particularly French, to become Americans. And, of course, Mr. Jefferson was a great, great fan of the French. And also part of that act was you could not speak against the government. It was one of the stupidest things John Adam ever did. And uh, Mr. Spate was a Federalist, which is that party. But when the Alien and Sedition Acts came out, he switched parties. And Mr. Stanley was a Federalist, and his accusation was that Mr. Spate switched parties only to get local votes because the town was largely Jeffersonian. And that, that is what Mr. Spate reacted to. But you, you see the, the battle between the viewpoints, and then there's a very strong secondary part. And while Mr. Hand was researching the story, he stumbled upon the fact that Mr. Spate had a, a, fa a favorite slave. Her name was Sarah, Sarah Rice. And... Uh, she had a son, 
and her son, which Mrs. Pate probably did not know, was fathered by John Stanley. Uh. In that day, of course, a slave woman had no rights, and if a man decided he liked her, he could take her to bed, and she had little to say about it. And that is what happened. Uh, we have our famous Barbara Jack, the, ba the black former slave who was the biggest slave owner in the, in the state. And uh, his father was John Wright Stanley, who followed him through a slave woman who was brought back on board a boat by one of his ship captains. And so you see her struggle and her desire for freedom throughout the story as well, and how she is. And so it's called honor, and it's his honor, the honor he is trying to defend, and how worthy is that honor to, to go to those ends or not, and her honor of trying to find her own freedom and her own voice for her and her son. And these two come together, and it's, it's a, some, some humor. I wouldn't say quite comedy, but there's definitely some humor and uh, a lot of drama and action. I believe you were there, as a matter of fact. I uh, did. I saw I, right there in the front row with yes. the amazing Lisa Lee. I've, yes. <laughs> I've met this woman, and I, it's the first time I've ever met someone I could not out talk, no matter yes, how I, I tried. In, in fact, that was one of the very first stage performances I ever saw. Oh, indeed. I absolutely fell in, and fell in love with it. Like something I never thought I would have enjoyed. Oh, I'm glad stage to stage performances, and that, that performance, like, changed my mind. It was more catching, I don't know if that's the right word, but more catching to me than, like, going to a, today's movies. It was... They're the, a great experience of being that close to the live actors as they are performing, and it is, it is the only art form, other than dance, perhaps, that takes place as you are watching. The art only begins... When you are sitting and watching it, the art ends at is the it, curtain call, yeah. and it's it's gone. It's, Cur it's yes. a very immediate experience. Well, I think it's, um, and they probably don't get enough credit in society. The stage actors are, you know, they don't get a do over. When no. the lights turn on, when we go to the movies and we watch your Will Smiths and Arnold Schwarzeneggers uh -huh. and all that kind of stuff. They could have done that scene 50 times to yep. get it just perfect. Your theater actor, one shot. Yes, yes, there are um, and, some of the, one of the uh, Shakespearean plays that, uh, uh, what is his name? The I shall sell no wine before it's time. Uh, that, that, that man, you know, the, the huge fellow. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> from, uh, from Citizen Kane, that director. But uh, he, he directed a, a version of, of the Othello. I can't remember what play it was, but I, I remember talking about, reading about the, uh, how, how that was shot. And there's a sword fight in it. That sword fight alone, which took up three or four minutes of screen time at most, took over a month to shoot. Mm. So you're going over and over, and the camera's changing. You look at all these tight, little tight things. And, and in, in a film, of course, it has that advantage. It can zoom right into just your eye if it wants to. And then when you're watching a stage production, the, the view is always the same as far as how far they are. You're seeing everything on the stage. And yet there's an immediacy to it. And there's how the performers interpret it. And, and it is a one-shot deal. If you, if you blow it, that, that's it. If you suddenly have no idea what to say and no one else does, the show stops. Mm -hmm until someone runs and grabs yes. a script or something. And I, I've seen shows where that has happened. I've, Mr. Hand has told me of, of directing a American Girl one time. Uh, and the actors on stage got so hopelessly lost. They started just wandering in circles and saying anything that came to their head. And one would suddenly make an excuse to walk off and he'd come to go look at the script and come back. And he still couldn't figure out where he was. It was a... A horrific moment, probably worse for them on stage than it was for Mr. Hand, but uh, he was he was in the lighting booth tearing out his hair at the time. It's amazing he's not bald from it, but uh, yes, that, so, and a play can tell a story in a different way than a movie. Obviously, there's no CGI, there's no huge effects. Uh, there, you, you can, and without a very large budget, you cannot have an elaborate stage, but you can use that to your advantage, and... Um, in honor, uh, there's a lot of uh, play of how the stage is used and the symbolism that happens. There's a, a scene in which... Um, I, actually, I thought the stage was quite elaborate. I actually sat in my garage for about six. Well, that is true. It, it did sit there down. And now most of it is sitting over at the Bryce's Creek Bible Church barn. There is no Bryce's Creek Bible Church. It was torn down by NCDOT. They're worshiping in a barn now. 
Um, but in that barn, there are all those platforms that were at your place, and we're trying very hard to find a place to, to move them once again for a permanent well, home. What I found fascinating but, uh, about the stage work mm -hmm. is how pieces of the state, like um, of the props, being like multi purposed. And, yes. And like the rehearsal that would just have to go into the stage crew on top of the rehearsal of the actors like yes it was uh, it, it's quite elaborate um, everything is very carefully figured and written down there's papers hanging on the back walls saying who moves what when and uh, actors leave stage and they scurry quickly because there's a, a big huge platform of a couch and a chair and a desk being pushed on the yes. stage <laughs> yes. uh, and and you can't have an audience sitting for 15 minutes despite a little bit of music in between scene changing so everything it it is quite quite a, a, an adventure, and backstage is a very busy place. Nobody so, sits for very long. All right. Well, Mr. Twain, mm -hmm. we are just about out of time. All right. So, but in order for us to end this, I'm going to have to go back to the sound room, and then all during right, that time, that that'll give you a, a few minutes here to yes, wrap I up, should, remind everybody where they can get to. A few things coming up, and. Uh, we're not the only theater in town. Let me tell you a little bit about what is happening in a couple of other theaters. Uh, we are, of course, uh, we're friends with the, with the others. There is River Town Players is doing a show called The Wedding Singer, and you can go to their website at rivertownplayers.org. Rivertown is, once again, that, that British thing going, rivertown, T-O-W-N-E, players.org. They're doing The Wedding Singer, and it's a very uh, colorful musical show, and it is on February 25th and 26th, and March 4th, 5th, 11th, and 12th at 7.30, February 27th, and March 6th at 3 o'clock, and that's overriding some of what we're doing, but I would suggest you go ahead and see both. They're, they're all great things, and I see that the Civic Theater, whose uh, auditorium has been torn up rather severely for all sorts of uh, reconstruction and work there, but they are putting out a play called Almost Maine. On, it says weekends, March 11th to 20th. Their Facebook page puts it, and they describe it as Almost Maine as a place that's so far north it's almost not in the United States. One cold, clear winter night as the uh, northern lights hover in the star-filled sky above, the residents of Almost Maine find themselves turn, turn, falling in and out of love in unexpected and hilarious ways. Knees are bruised, hearts are broken, but the bruises heal and the hearts mend almost in this delightful midwinter night's dream. Also coming up, uh, you are probably aware or possibly aware that uh, the Ghent community will be having its annual Mardi Gras. And that is coming up on February the 26th from 11 to 15. It goes from 11 o'clock in the morning till around 4 or 5 o'clock. At 3 o'clock, they have a little grand parade. And in that grand parade, along with all the colorful characters, you will see the cast and uh, others of the North Carolina History Theater in costume taking part in that parade and passing around some flyers to help you to remember to come and see us again. But it will be a great day with all sorts of uh, music and uh, Food vendors and everything else all around every year gets a little bit bigger. I believe this is their sixth year coming up. Let me take a look at this computer here that Mr. Hand loaned to me. It is the sixth annual New Bern Mardi Gras. And you can look up their site at on visitnc.com has some, some links about it. So we strongly encourage you to take place in the arts. New Bern is a place that is rich, very rich in all artistic vendors. So are we ready to uh, close out then, Mr.? We are ready when you are, Indeed. kind sir. Well, this is Samuel Clemens, otherwise known as Mark Twain, inviting you to come see our show and uh, saying for Mr. Bill Hand and uh, Mr. Per Erickson, who also could not make today, but uh, and thank you, Mr. Eric, for sitting in with us and uh, spilling a little beans throughout the morning, <laughs> as they might say up in Boston way. Very well. We'll see you next week. Have a good day. Rolling on day.